Recently, I delivered a sermon, or actually a couple of sermons, about the tribulation, the great tribulation. And the second sermon that I delivered, I scanned the audience and I happened to notice that there were several young people in that audience, several people that were below the age of four or five, but there were some people that were just turning into the early teens. And the more I thought about it, I began to question in my mind what those young people thought about it because the tribulation is not a, peri a pretty period of time. It's a time of great trouble, a time of great distress, and I wondered what about the children? What do they think about the tribulation? What do they think about the troubles that lie ahead? You know, it, in the Bible, particularly Deuteronomy 28 and Leviticus 26, it speaks very graphically about certain subjects, certain topics that is going to take place in the near future. Sure, we talk about captivity. Well, that's something down the road, something that we have a very difficult time wrapping our minds around and even comprehending that we, the United States of America and Britain, could even go into captivity. So that's something that may be some ethereal thought, possibility, maybe that's going to happen 30, 40, 50, 100 years from now. But it's hard for a child and even God's people to even comprehend the fact that the United States of America, as great as it is, as powerful as it is, could go into captivity. And then even to begin to think that a third of our people would be destroyed by famine, pestilence, and disease, and then another third by warfare. Those are a lot of concepts and ideas that are very, very difficult for young people to comprehend. So the more I thought about the children, and I asked myself, what about the children? How do they feel about these types of sermons? How do they feel about current events that are taking place in the world around us? How do they feel about things that are taking on uh, taking place in their schools and in their daily lives because we understand that it's a very difficult time for people to be living. So my purpose today is to help the parents and the children, and I hope that if there's any children out there that are listening that they'll sit up, take notice, because we're going to be talking to the children of God, but also the children of the parents of the children of God today. So I want to help the children and the parents cope with the horrible events that are seen on TV every day and the prophecies predicting earth-shaking events just ahead of us. You know, I remember as a young boy hearing my father, my uncles, that used to get together on the weekends, usually on Sunday afternoons after um, not many of them went to church, but they all had their ideas and philosophies about church and about religion. So I would sit on the front porch and I would hear them banter back and forth about different biblical questions. And of course, they knew just about enough to make it dangerous for them. They didn't understand the plan of God, but they thought they did. They, under, they thought they understood what God intended for mankind. So they, they began talking about certain things. And one of the things that used to frighten me was when they talked about, and of course they were referring to the scriptures relate to the day of the Lord, when it would be a time of cataclysmic events, when meteorites and meteors would be falling from the earth, the heavenly bodies would be shaking, pounding the earth, hail balls, just different types of events that would be taking place in the heavens. And one of the things was that the sun would not give her light and the moon would become as blood. And I can remember as a, as a young boy having heard those thoughts in my mind and as the sun began to set in the west and I knew that I needed to be home by dark and many times I would time it so I could just hit the porch just about the time that the sun would set. But there were times that after I got to the porch and I would sit there on the porch and I would look up into the heavens and it would be pitch black. And because of atmospheric conditions, there were times that the moon would look like it was blood red. And you think that didn't frighten me? I was wondering, is it time? Is it time for the end of the world to take place? Because I'd heard them talk about the end of the world. I'd heard them talking about people going to an ever-burning hell fire and that the earth would one day be consumed in flames. So many times when I saw certain conditions, it made me think, is it time? Is the end of the world coming with the moon being blood red? It made me wonder and it made me think. So I'm, I'm inclined to think that the young people that are sitting out in the audience, and I realize 
that they don't sit there and listen to the minister all the time. A lot of times they have to have their minds preoccupied with things because most of the subjects that we talk about are geared toward the adults, geared toward prophecy, geared toward Christian living for parents, for the adults in the church. But the young people, sometimes they'll listen. Sometimes the minister might say something in his sermon that would pique their interest. So they would sit up, take notice, and listen for a while. I remember many times when I went to Sunday school and I would look around the room. Uh, I tried to blot out what the minister was saying, actually. So I'd look around the room and I'd try to see what other people were doing and I'd occasionally find someone that was talking to someone or uh, Mr. Smith or Mr. Jones would be dozing off and of course my buddy next to me we'd punch one another and we'd laugh looking over there at Mr. Jones and uh, sometimes we'd draw c cartoons. We would do different things during church services to keep ourselves amused during that period of time. But occasionally you do listen and occasionally our children do listen so it makes me concerned about the children and so this sermon today is geared primarily toward them and to the parents of those children. You know I want you to turn in your Bibles with me back to Deuteronomy the sixth chapter. Deuteronomy 6 and let's begin reading in verse 4. Verse 4 says, Hear O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Does your children know that? Does your children know that there is a God family? Do they know the difference between the Father and between Jesus Christ? Can you explain that to them? Can you explain to them that there is a God family? And you could go back to Genesis 1, verse 1, John 1, verse 1, and you could say, in the beginning, God, and you could explain to them that that Hebrew word in Genesis and the Greek word over in John means family, Elohim, and it means plural. And you could explain to them certain concepts that God is a family, but He's one God, He's one family, just looking at your family the children there with the husband and the wife and two or three children maybe, and you say, we are one family even though there are many members of us. Right now there are two members in the God family. So we need to explain to our children that there is one Lord, and that's what your Bible says. And verse 5, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words which I command you this day shall be in your heart. Now notice we are in chapter 6 of, Deut of Deuteronomy. Just before that, in Deuteronomy 5, he had just been given the Ten Commandments. Now let me ask you this question, parents, and you children as well. Do you know the Ten Commandments? Can you list all ten of those commandments? Oh, you probably say, well, I know about the Sabbath. And let's see, uh, are, are there others? Well, sure there are. You know, we need to teach our children at least the Ten Commandments and expound upon those. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. You shall not make unto the any graven images. Explain to your children why you're observing Saturday as the seventh day of the week and the Sabbath. And then you can go on and expound upon each one of those commandments. They need to learn those. They need to memorize those. They need to be written in their minds. Notice what it says, verse 7, And you shall teach your children diligently and shall talk of them when you sit in your house. Do you talk about spiritual things? Do you talk with your children about certain situations that occurred at school and how they as godly children should be obeying those and how they should be solving those things? That's an excellent opportunity when you're sitting around the table, if you sit around the table, you know a lot of people today don't even eat together. That would be an excellent opportunity for you to sit around a table with your children and discuss certain situations. Make sure the television is off during that period of time. Make sure that they're not into any TV games or any video games, but during this period of time, we're going to sit down as a family and have a meal together. And during that period of time, we open up family discussions. So you're to talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. You see, when you're riding along in your automobile, a lot of parents will just give their children some type of a coloring book or some type of item, which is not wrong to keep them occupied. You can't talk about religious things all the time, but there are specific period of times that you could even talk to your children about biblical things. You could tell them Bible stories. Notice it says here, when you lie down, do you, do you tuck your children in at night? That's an excellent opportunity to sit down with them, read them a story, maybe from the old... Uh, 
Worldwide Church of God Bible stories or maybe some other stories that you might be able to tell them about David and Goliath, about Daniel and the lion's den, about Moses when he led the children of Israel through the Red Sea. Lots of things in the Bible are very, very interesting. And if you have any desires at all, then you should be able to teach your children when they lie down and when you're traveling in automobiles and around the table. That's an excellent opportunity. And you shall bind them for a sign upon your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. In other words, we should be teaching our children so that biblical principles are being instilled in their very mind so that they will be able to live by the Word of God. I want you to notice in Exodus 12 and verse 23. In Exodus 12, notice verse 23. This is an excellent, excellent passage of scriptures to teach your children. But notice what your Bible says about it. In Exodus 12, verse 23, For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians. Now, of course, I'm breaking in the middle of a thought. You can read around it and lead up to it and tell them what's going on. And when he sees the blood upon the lintel and the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come in unto your house to smite you. So you can go back and tell them about how they had to put up a lamb on the 10th day, keep it to the 14th. They had to slay it, take the blood of that lamb, put it over the doorpost and over the lentil, and because of that, it showed their faith in God and their trust in God. And when the destroyer would come through that night, it would pass over their house, and they were to explain it to them. Reading on to verse 24, And you shall observe this thing for an ordinance to you and to your sons forever. God commands this ordinance, this ceremony to be kept forever and it shall come to pass when you come to the land which the Lord will give you according as he has promised that you shall keep this service how clear much clearer could that be that we are to keep this service of course we understand that Jesus Christ changed the symbols to the Passover because he was the Lamb of God and instead of slaying that lamb and putting the door over the, the blood, excuse me, over the doorpost, then the blood of Jesus Christ was shed for us and blotted out symbolically, putting it over the doorpost of our hearts and blotting out our sins. So it was to be kept. The only thing that was changed was assembled. But notice verse 26, And it shall come to pass when your children shall say unto you, What means you by this service? Does your children know why every year on Passover evening, you gather up some towels, you gather up some wash basins, and you go off to a place that's going to begin a service sometime right after sunset, and you tell them, well, we're going to Passover services. Do they understand why? It just says that you need to teach them. It just says you need to tell them. They need to understand about the blood of Jesus Christ because one day they're going to have to make a decision. Now, what happens when they get old enough and become of age and be held responsible, and they don't know anything about this blood of Jesus Christ and this Passover? We as parents haven't done our job, have we? So who knows what will happen for the next generation if we teach our children properly. They should know and they should understand what this service means. It says, teach them. For verse 27, that you shall say, it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover. Even tells you what to say. Who pass over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt. And here, Jesus Christ's blood passed over our sins while we were living in Egypt, which is a type of sin. You can read about that over in Hebrews, the 11th chapter, that Egypt is a type of sin. When he smote the Egyptians and delivered our houses, and the people bowed the head and they worshiped God. Turn back just a, or turn over, excuse me, a couple of chapters, Exodus 20. Exodus 20, and notice verse 12. Now, you young people should pay particular attention. This is one of the Ten Commandments, but it has some import for you if you'll just read it and if you'll just do it. In Exodus 20, verse 12, it says, Honor your father and your mother. Do you respect your mother and father? Well, you should, because if you do, it says that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God gives you. So if you want long life, Respect and honor your mother and father. Notice Proverbs, the 22nd chapter. Proverbs 22. 
and verse 6. It says, train up a child in the way that he should go. Well, what way should he go? Well, certainly we just read that he should keep the commandments of God. So we need to train our children pursuant to the Word of God. We need to teach them biblical scriptures, biblical principles of how to live their life, how to deal with various situations, how to deal with various situations at school, how to deal with the drug problem, how to deal with those that are trying to pressure them into illicit sex before their time without, uh, without marriage. We need to explain to them how to avoid alcoholism. We need to talk to them and train them in the way of God. And it says, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. In other words, if you instill within that child certain principles, even when they get older and even when they make up their own mind, even they make certain decisions, there are certain things that you're, you're going to teach them that will help them throughout life. For instance, not to steal. I mean, even though they may never come into the body of Christ, if you teach that child not to steal, that's going to be a, a biblical principle instilled in their mind that's going to live with them forever. They won't cheat on their income tax, they won't steal from their neighbor, and they probably won't end up in jail. Now, you can also teach them not to bear false witnesses. Don't tell stories, don't tell lies. There's no such thing as a little white lie. A lie is a lie, and anyone who tells a lie is a liar. That's what your Bible says. Anyone who says that he keeps the commandments or anyone, excuse me, that says he loves God and keepeth not his commandments, he's a liar, and the truth's not in him. That's according to the Word of God. So we need to be training our children and teaching them certain basic principles along the way. Now notice Proverbs 23 and verse 13. It says, Withhold not correction from the child. You know, in this day and age, parents have for some reason, I guess uh, the doctor, what was his name? I wanted to say Spock. Uh, but anyway, if, if that was him who in introduced the concept of letting children go through various stages and they're going to um, maybe write on the wall as soon as they're able to uh, handle a crayon in their hand. That's all right. That's showing them their uh, ability to express themselves. Or let them go ahead and play in, in a dirty commode because that's all right because one day they may be a, an aqua engineer. You know, that type of reasoning, just let the child do whatever they want to do. The child becomes the center of attention and the adults many times have to wrap their lives around that child because there is no discipline, because there is no correction in their life. They don't point them in the right direction. But your Bible says, don't withhold that correction. But notice what it does say from the child. For if you beat him with the rod, he shall not die. Now, I'm sure the, the Bible does not mean to beat him literally. It means to give him a spanking. Now, I know that many times parents don't have the ability to balance that out. And many children have been actually beaten. And many of the times the uh, children are actually taken from the parents. So there has to be a balance there in the type of correction that you give. The punishment should fit the crime. You know, sometimes just time out will work for some children. Sometimes taking away the local uh, telephone call right after school to the, to the friends. There's different ways of correcting children, but there has to be some type of correction. That child has to know that there is a cause and effect, that there is a penalty for the wrongs that they do in their lives. And if you don't teach them, they'll never learn it. Notice verse 14, you shall beat him or correct him with the rod and shall deliver his soul from the grave. You know, I've known a lot of children particularly when I was running a juvenile institution, there were a lot of children that had no discipline in their lives and ended up actually having their lives taken. We have young people's lives are being snuffed out every single day in some of our cities and some of our ghettos by joining gangs. And then one of the things you have to do to join that gang is to go out and kill someone else from a rival gang member. So, you know, if we teach them right, maybe we can keep them from an early death. Notice verse 22, hearken unto your father and that beget you and despise not your mother when she is old. Again, following that principle of honoring your mother and father and listening to your parents. You know, lots of times parents are telling children certain things to do that they've already done and made the mistake and they know the penalty from it. But it seems like that young people whose minds are shut out to the instruction from the parents, they have to do it their way. And as a result, they're going to pay the penalty as well. It just seems like that's part of human nature. But the child that is receptive to the parent's teaching and instruction, happier they're going to be. Notice verse 26. My son, give me your heart or your mind and let your eyes observe my ways. Parents, 
we should be setting the right example for our children. It reminds me of the television commercial that used to be on television when this young father, probably in his 30s or 40s, was sitting out in a, a field, and there was this beautiful tree, looked like an oak tree maybe, and the little child, uh, just several years old, two or three maybe, uh, just old enough to uh, be a toddler and to get around, and the father was there with him, and they were talking, and it was a beautiful scene. But then the father reaches up in his pocket and pulls out a cigarette, and he lights it up, and he lays the pack down on the ground. And then the camera shifts down to the little child. He looked up at his father, and his father was lighting the cigarette, taking a great big puff, and about that time, the little boy reached over in the pack and put one in his mouth. So you see, our children are watching what we do. Maybe they're not listening to what we say, but they certainly will watch what we do. Over in Ephesians, the sixth chapter, Ephesians 6, notice verse 1. It says, Children, this is to children. Obey your parents in the Lord. In other words, obey your parents as they serve God. For this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. We just read that back in Exodus. That it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. Now, this is a message to the fathers. You know, sometimes fathers do not have the patience they need. I know as a young man, I probably didn't have the patience that I needed. And a lot of times, I would snap at my children. A lot of times, I would uh, come across with a rough voice. I wanted them to obey. I wanted them to know that I meant business. But sometimes, my voice was too uh, evasive. And sometimes, it provoked the children. And it says, you fathers, provoke not your children to wrath but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. You know, that's one of the things that we in God's church need to be working on, and that's patience. Patience particularly with our children because the, the way we deal with them is going to affect probably the way they're going to deal with their children in the future. If you scream at them, if you yell at them, and God forbid, if you curse them and even beat them, then unless they break that chain, then that's the way they're going to be dealing with their children when they get older. So God says that we should be doing it differently. Now, what are the blessings for obedience? Let's go over to Mark, the 10th chapter. In Mark 10, let's notice verse 13. Mark 10 and verse 13. Christ mixed himself with the crowds. He was constantly going from city to city and would go down into the square and down into the marketplace, and the people were able to come around him. Of course, he healed a lot of people, and that drew the people's attention to him. He performed many miracles, and that too brought the people to him. But in this particular case, in verse 13, and they, the parents, brought young children to him that he should touch them. And his disciples rebuked those that brought them. Now keep in mind, his disciples thought that Jesus Christ was coming to this earth to start a revolution. They were young revolutionaries. They didn't realize what Christ was here for. They had not been converted yet. They were planning a revolution. They thought that Jesus Christ was going to be the one to lead them against the Roman army, and they were going to take back the kingdom of Judea and restore it as it was under the days of David. So they didn't have time for these kids. They just were about the business of getting this revolution done. Let's get more people following us. But Christ says in verse 14, But when Jesus saw it, he was much displeased and said unto them, Allow these little children to come unto me and forbid them not. Now he saw an excellent opportunity to show his disciples the type of attitudes they had. For he says, For of such, of such of these little children is the kingdom of God. Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. So Christ was telling them that these little children, and they were obedient children. They were not children that were uh, interrupting when they shouldn't have. These were not children that were doing things, uh, throwing things, and uh, making faces, or uh, just doing lots of things that, that you see people do or children do in drugstores and uh, grocery stores and dentist offices, and you just shake your head and say, boy, somebody needs to teach him a lesson. Someone needs to correct that child. But these weren't that type of children. These were obedient children. And he looked at his disciples and says, you need to develop the same attitude these little children have. They're forgiving. They were not uh, filled with pride or vanity or jealousy. They were just 
little children. And the parents wanted Christ to bless them. So we have a tradition in the church. It's called the blessing of the little children. That little small children will come to the ministry and the ministers can lay hands on them following Christ's example and ask God to bless them and to protect them along the way. Luke, the second chapter. Luke 2, in verse 40. Now he's talking about Christ. I'm not going to elaborate on this too much, but it, it did say that the child grew, and it's talking about Christ, and he grew strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. You see, Jesus Christ, who instituted the Passover back here in, in Exodus 12, 13, 14 that we read about, every year he kept the Passover. He observed it faithfully with his parents. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. Now after the feast was over, and of course the feast were there, uh, the Passover, the Days of Unleavened Bread, and when that was over, they packed up and they went home. But they had gotten out a day's journey and they started looking around. Well, where's Jesus? Well, he wasn't there. Jesus was such a responsible child that they knew he wouldn't have wandered off and done anything that was irresponsible. So they just assumed, apparently, that he was with other members of the family and was traveling along with the caravan, headed back home. So they went back and finally found him. And when they did, he says, well, why are you so worried? Did you not know I had to be about my father's business? But when they went on back home, notice verse 50, and they understood not the sayings which he spoke unto them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. Jesus Christ was an obedient child. He kept the commandments. He honored his mother and his father. He never once disobeyed them. Now that is almost impossible for us to comprehend, isn't it? That anyone could obey their parents in everything. But that's the type of child he was. He was filled with the Holy Spirit, and he was able to do that which was right, even keeping the commandments as a small child. Let's notice Luke 21. Luke 21 and verse 36. This is a scripture that we are constantly referring back to when we talk about the tribulation. And I'm sure that the young people are wondering, what's going to happen to us during this tribulation? What's going to happen to my parents during the tribulation? Will we be protected? Well, notice what it says in verse 36. Watch you therefore. Watch world events. Watch the things that are taking place in the news today. Watch the, the rise of Europe. Watch the dependence upon oil. Watch the economy in the United States of America. Watch the emergence of this great church as it begins to wield more power and influence upon the nations of the world. There are lots of things that we need to watch. We need to watch the nations, particularly the United States and Britain, drifting away from God and becoming even more paganized. And that is happening constantly on a daily basis. So we need to watch and pray always. Well, what are we supposed to pray for? that we may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that are going to come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Well, why are we supposed to pray? So we can be accounted worthy to escape these things. What type of people are going to escape these things? Well, obedient people, people that are obeying God, people that are under the shadow of the Almighty, people that are keeping the commandments of God, people that He can put His wings over and protect during this time of trouble. In some of our recent sermons, we've talked about that type of protection. Psalm 91 is a beautiful example of God as a feathered being, uh, just putting his wings down over his people and protecting them. You know, God has promised protection. Yes, we understand that some are going to have to pay the supreme price. Some are going to have to witness for the testimony they have of Jesus Christ, but not all of them. There's going to be some that will have to pay that price, but they will be able to do it. They will be able to meet the challenge because God said, I will not put on you more than you can stand. So if that responsibility falls upon any of us, then we can rely on God's word that he will get us through it, that he will see us through to the end. Now notice back in Exodus 12 and verse 29. Exodus 12 and verse 29. Sometimes we get so wrapped up with the here and the now. We get so wrapped up with the things that we can see with our eyes. Things that 
we look at and they appear to be one way and immediately our mind begins to focus in and draw conclusions this is the only way that this can possibly work out this is the only way that this particular problem can be solved so we worry we toss it around in our minds and there's one thing that we forget and it is very very difficult for God's people to do and that is to have faith and trust in God notice Exodus 12 and verse 29 the night of the Passover this is referring right back to the passage that we read earlier. And it says, And it came to pass that at midnight, on that night at midnight, the Lord did smite the firstborn in the land of Egypt from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sat on his throne to the firstborn of the captive that was in the dungeon and all the firstborn of the cattle. God kept his promise. For those that killed the lamb, put the blood over the doorpost and the lentil, he passed over and he did not slay any of them. But all the Egyptians, he killed the firstborn of their, their children and the firstborn of all their cattle. Now notice just back one chapter to Exodus 10. Exodus 10 and notice verse 4. And Moses said, Thus says the Lord about midnight, referring to the passage we just read, Will I go out into the midst of Egypt? And all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die. From the firstborn of Pharaoh that sits upon his throne, even unto the firstborn of the maidservant that is behind the mill, and all the firstborn of the beast. And there shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as there was none like it, nor shall be like it any more. Death and destruction was taking place all throughout the land of Egypt. Notice verse 7. But against any of the children of Israel shall not a dog move his tongue. No, there was not even a dog that was going to bark at the children of Israel. Against man or beast, that you may know how that the Lord does put a difference between the Egyptians and the Israelis. God will put a difference between those who obey Him and those who do not. You see, that's where the blessings of obedience comes in. We must trust God. Now notice a passage over in 1 Corinthians 11. 1 Corinthians 11. And let's notice verse 1. The Apostle Paul says, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. You know, you should not, and I'm talking to the parents now, you should not follow or support any minister that is not following Jesus Christ of Nazareth's example. You should not do that. So Paul says, I'm following Christ, so therefore follow me. Follow my instructions, because Paul was taught by Christ. He went down into Arabia, and through vision or through personal contact with Christ, I know not, but I do know that he learned the truth, the gospel, his conversion process took place from Jesus Christ himself. He said, I'm separate from the other 12. I learned it differently, but he got the same message that the original 12 got, and he got it from Jesus Christ. So he says, follow me. So the letter that is written here is instruction inspired by Jesus Christ for the members of the church, for those who will have understanding, for those who will be willing to follow these directions. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances that I delivered them to you. And of course, as you read through Corinthians and Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Hebrews, you see the ordinances or you see the word that Paul delivered to them under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. What is he saying here? Well, he's laying the groundwork. He's trying to explain something by setting up the position of authority. He says, here is the Father, here is Christ, and then here comes the man in this particular order. And he says there needs to be a certain de degree of respect for the Father and for the husband and for Jesus Christ, of course. And he's talking about praying. He says in verse 4, Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonors his head. Who's the head? Well, Christ is the head. Christ is the head of the church. So any man that covers his head with a do-rag or with a beanie or whatever it may be, it says he dishonors his head. He dishonors Christ by covering his head. But every woman that prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. Who's her head? The husband. So we see here that 
Christ is the head of the man, and the man is the head of the woman. And that's the analogy that he is trying to set up here. For that is even all one as if she were shaven. Well, what's Paul talking about here? He's talking about men and women praying and, and being in, in services. In verse 6 it says, For if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. He's saying that the man should not cover his head in praying, but the woman should cover her head. And if she isn't going to cover her head, she needs to go ahead and do just like the temple prostitutes and shave herself bald. That's the analogy he's using here. So the man should not shave, have his head covered, but the woman should have her head covered. Now, what are we talking about here? Are we talking about hats? Are we talking about veils? What are we talking about? For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much as he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. You see, we're talking about respect. We're talking about honor here and how we should appear before God. For the man is not of the woman, and the woman, but the woman is of the man. God created the man first. God created man, and he took a, a rib out of man and made the woman. So the woman came from man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. God created the woman as a helpmate. Now, notice what he says in verse 10. For this cause, because there is a difference in responsibility, for this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. She should have power on her head. In other words, she should have a covering on her head. Now let's notice what this is, and I want to come back to verse 10 in just a moment and explain that to you. In verse 13 it says, Judge in yourselves, is it comely that a woman pray unto God uncovered? Does not even nature itself teach you, now here's the clue, that a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him. So you see, he's talking about hair, the covering on our head. Some of us have more than others. Some of us have very little, but he's talking about a man should have short hair. Notice what it says in verse 14. Does not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it's a shame unto him? But if a woman have long hair, it's a glory to her, for her hair is what? Given to her for a covering. So you see, there's a difference between men and women, and if the woman has long hair, she's showing respect unto her husband. Now notice verse 10, and if she does show the respect unto her husband, then what it says here that she will have power on her head, she will be properly covered, she will be in subjection to her husband, and it will probably be an obedient family in most cases. And because of the angels, you see, God expects us to obey him. Now we get a clue about what he's talking to here, or we're talking about here, back in Psalm, the 34th chapter. Notice Psalm 34. Psalm 34 and verse 7. This is David inspired to write this, and he says, The angel of the Lord, the angel from the Lord, what does this angel do? He encamps round about them that fear him and delivers them. Do you understand what Paul is talking about now? The woman who is in sub subjection to her husband and is obedient and the husband, of course, loves the wife and is obedient to her, and they are teaching their children that fear the Lord their God, there is an angel that encompasses around them, and that angel is there for protection. You know, most people don't understand about angels. Angels are spirit beings. They were created by God. They are lower than the Father and the Son. They are higher than man. They're somewhere in between. Man was made a little lower than the angels for now. Christ took on the seed of Abraham, which made him lower than the angels temporarily. But the angels were sent here, and, and you can read this in Hebrews, the first chapter, the last couple of verses, that the angels were sent here as servants and messengers to help the people that God is training for his kingdom. So we, we understand that the woman that is in subjection and the family that is obedient to God, we have angelic protection around us. Now when we disobey God and we go contrary to God's laws, then we're not going to have that angelic protection. It reminds me of the, the joke that was told about the man that was speeding down the highway. And his wife looked over at him and says, look, she says, uh, you're speeding. He says, oh, I've got angelic protection. She says, no, you just outrun him. So there's no way that the angels can keep up and protect us when we're not doing what we should. You know, there has to be obedience for us to receive the blessings. Now let's notice another Example there in Matthew, the 18th chapter. In Matthew 18, notice verse 10. 
It says, Take heed that you despise not one of these little ones. It's talking about children. For I say unto you, that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. Now I heard one of the famous televangelists explaining this verse. And the people were asking him, what about the children? What's going to happen to them when they die? And he says, well, it says here that they're going to go to heaven. That is not what it says. It says that in heaven, the angels that are watching over these little children, and that's why we ask God to bless them and to protect them, the angels that watch over these little children, what do the angels do? They always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. So the angels are traveling back and forth to this earth, back into heaven, reporting to God. You can read about the throne of God in Revelation 4 when the great angelic beings, the four and twenty elders, uh, are around God's throne. There's just a whole host of activity in and about the throne of God, angels zipping down to the earth, reporting back to God. It even says that the seven spirits, or the seven angels, the seven eyes of God that go to and fro around the earth reporting back to him. So you can see he uses the angels. So let's not outrun our angels. Let's not do anything contrary to the angelic protection that God has offered us. Let's obey him and trust him. And he promises to protect us. Let's notice Psalm 128. In Psalm 128, notice verse 1. It says, Blessed is everyone that fears the Lord fears the Lord, and those that fear the Lord are going to obey the Lord. So those that fear Him are going to be keeping His commandments. And it says that walketh in His ways. Christ said, this is the way, walk ye in it. Follow my example. He says, you should live by every word that proceedeth from the mouth of God. If you'll enter into life, keep the commandments. All of those scriptures allude to obeying God Almighty, keeping His commandments. We need to be teaching our children to keep the commandments. We need to be setting that example ourselves. That which is found in the Word of God, and we understand what it means, then we should be trying to live our lives accordingly and keeping the commandments of God, putting out sin from our lives, as it depicts from the days of unleavened bread, and putting on the divine nature of God. We need to understand. We need to comprehend that the days on this earth are coming shorter and shorter, and Jesus Christ is coming back to this earth. He will come back and marry the bride that has made herself ready, that has been washed with the Word, in other words, applying the Word in their lives and removing all the spots and wrinkles, which is sin. So we need to be about the business of obeying God and putting Him in our lives and get rid of some of this fluff out of here of getting involved in the world and want to be a part of it. We need to be separating ourselves from it, and we need to be teaching our children to do so as well. And the only way you can do that is by setting the example. If we've got one foot in the world all the time, our children are going to be right there with a foot in the world as well. So he says in verse 2 of Psalm 128, For you shall eat the labor of your hands, happy shall you be, and it shall be well with you. Why will it be well with you? Because you're obeying God. Your wife shall be a fruitful vine. In other words, she'll have children, and they'll be healthy children by the sides of your house. Your children like olive plants round about the table. You know, decorations, beautiful flowers sitting around, around the table while you're having a, a fine Sabbath meal or an afternoon meal. It's decorated with beautiful flowers and plants. Behold, that thus shall the man be blessed that fears the Lord. The Lord shall bless you out of Zion, and you shall see the good of Jerusalem all the days of your life. Now notice verse 6. Yea, you shall see your children's children and peace upon Israel. We're talking about a time in the not too far distant future, and we're going to be able to see our children's children. If we're obeying God, He has promised to protect us, and we'll be able to see not only our children, but our children's children, our grandchildren, and maybe our grandchildren's children. And also, we should be able to know peace. So you see, God promises certain blessings for obedience to Him. Even children. God will protect the children that obey Him. You know, I've known young children back uh, years ago that were even called into the church at a very early age. If they set out to seek the Lord and they want to obey Him, the more they obey Him, the more information and knowledge God will give them. And the more He will reveal to them, even children at a young mind. And then when they're old enough, then they can make a decision about whether or not they want to be baptized and become members of the body of Christ. The future for our children should not be gloomy, but it should be bright. It should be something that we need to be looking forward to. 
Yes, I talk about the tribulation, and I know it's going to be a time of great destruction. I know it's going to be a time of trouble. I understand that, but the only way to get through that, that time of trouble and tribulation to get to that wonderful world tomorrow is through that tribulation. But we must put our trust in God during that period of time that He will take care of us, and He will watch over us and see us through it. We've got to have that type of faith. Notice Matthew 24 and verse 21. We understand about the tribulation that mankind has nuclear weapons now. Mankind will use those nuclear weapons and they'll be just blasting down upon the various cities around the world. There'll be nuclear fallout. Cities are going to be laid waste. The ships in the ocean and the sea are going to be sunk. The waters will be turned with blood. I'm sorry, I can't help it. Those are predictions that are coming from the Word of God, things that are going to happen. We need to be putting our trust and our faith in God. But notice what it says in verse 21. And then, after all these things take place, the hurricanes, the uh, fam famines, pestilence, disease, the wars, the rumors of wars, all these are the beginning of sorrows. And then when they finally manifest themselves and the great tribulation begins, it says, such was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no nor ever shall be. But I want you to notice something here in verse 22. And except those days should be shortened, there would no flesh be saved alive. If God Almighty did not intervene and cut it short, every man, woman, and child would be killed by nuclear weapons. We would destroy ourselves. If you just notice on your television screen the attitude that is prevalent in some of these countries around the world today, getting upset over cartoons and destroying embassies and killing people and taking people hostage. There is an attitude of hatred around the world and they would destroy themselves. They don't really care whether they die or not. Their concept is that if they die, they're going to heaven and they'll be surrounded by X number of virgins and they'll live forever in paradise. So why not hurry up and get it over with? You see, that's the mentality that they have. They don't care. They don't fear death. And so they will destroy one another. All flesh should be destroyed except for the elect's sake. That is those that are God's, those that He has chosen, those that He has called, those that He has put over here in a protective skirt, those that are under His protective wing. God will protect them. He will intervene to keep all life from being destroyed from the face of the earth. So we see God is going to intervene, and the moment that He intervenes, we're going to see something marvelously happen. In Isaiah, the 65th chapter, in Isaiah 65, this is sometime in the very near future cannot be too far off. And this is something that our young people can be looking forward to. This is something that they should be anticipating with even hope. Notice Isaiah 65 and verse 8. Thy, Thus saith the Lord, as the new wine is found in the cluster, and one says, Destroy it not, for a blessing is in it, so will I do for my servant's sake, that I may not destroy them all. You see, God isn't going to destroy all the people on this earth. If man were left to himself, they would, but God's going to intervene, and he says they're not all going to be destroyed. And I will bring forth a seed, a remnant, out of Jacob and out of Judah, an inheritor of my mountains or nations, and mine elect. You see, he's going to cut it short for his elect's sake, and mine elect are going to do what? They're going to inherit it. They're going to inherit the land, and my servants shall dwell there. Now, notice this. Young people. I know you're concerned about what's going to happen to me if mom and dad are changed into spirit beings. Well, notice this passage of scriptures here in verse 22. They shall, not, they shall not build and another inhabit. They're going to build houses in the world tomorrow. They shall not plant and somebody else is going to eat it. If you plant a garden, you'll reap the benefits from it. For as the days of a tree are the days of my people, and mine elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. He says, you're going to be like a tree. A tree is on this earth for a long, long time. We've got trees here that they can prove are hundreds of, and maybe even thousands of years old. They shall not labor in vain, nor bring forth for trouble, for they are the, what? The seed of the blessed, of the Lord, and their offspring with them. This is talking about you children. The seed of the blessed. That is the children that are going to be over into the world tomorrow. You're going to be there with your parents. And it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer, and while they are speaking, I will hear. You're going to have teachers there to teach and to instruct God's way. And notice what a world is going to be like. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together. There will no, not be any carnivorous animals in the world tomorrow. Lions will eat straw and 
poisonous serpents will no longer be poisonous. And the lion shall eat straw like the bullock, and dust shall be the serpent's meat. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all of my holy mountain or nation, says the eternal. That is a world of peace. That is a world of prosperity. Now we understand, as it, you go back and read 1 Corinthians 15, verses 50 through 52, and it says that flesh and blood, we in our physical condition will not enter into the family or the kingdom of God. We just can't do it. We, we can't do it. We have to be changed. And the only way we can be changed is to repent of our sins, be baptized in a watery grave, have hands laid on us, receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, and then once we accept the blood of Jesus Christ, we must embark on a process of conversion, of putting sin out of our lives, of learning to walk with Christ. No guile found in our mouth. We must be learning to forgive one another, to love one another, to be putting on the nature and the mind of God. Then we will qualify to become a member of the family of God, and we'll be able to rule as Christ rules with the same mindset, and that family where it says, the Lord thy God is one God, then it will still be one family, but they will all be of the same mind. They will all have been tested. They will have been proven during this lifetime. They will acknowledge Jesus Christ. They will have overcome their sins. And he says, well done, enter into my family. And they receive their reward for the works they've done during this lifetime. Some will inherit ten cities. Some will inherit five cities. Some will inherit one cities. And some won't inherit any cities. What they had will be taken away from them and given to someone else those who did not obey, those who did not use the gifts and talents that God gave them. So what do you think is going to happen to the children of those saints that are immediately changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, and ascend up into the clouds to meet Jesus Christ? They're going to come back to this earth. And one of the first things they're going to do, probably, in all possibility, they may even take their children with them. Do you think that God Almighty is going to allow the parents to go up and leave the children in a world of waste and destruction? No, don't worry about it, children. Your parents will be there to take care of you. It says in Hebrews 13, 5, the Lord says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. We're going to be members of the God family. We will be doing the same thing. We will never leave nor forsake our children. They will be physical, flesh and blood children that will be able to live over into the wonderful world tomorrow. In Amos, the ninth chapter, Amos, the ninth chapter, gives us a very vivid description of the world tomorrow. And some of you all, very possibly, or your children, could very possibly be fulfilling this very scripture, as it says in Amos 9 and verse 11. Amos 9, verse 11. It says, In that day will I raise up the tabernacle of David. In other words, David throne will be initiated and Jesus Christ will come back to accept that throne and he'll rule from the throne of David. That what is fallen now and close up the breaches thereof and I will raise up his ruins and I will build it as in the old days that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all of the heathen which are called by my name says the Lord that doeth this. And it talks about a land of peace, a land of prosperity. Continue to read the rest of those passages there, and you'll see that they'll be planting gardens, they'll be reaping the benefits from those gardens, we'll be eating physical food. Even though spirit beings won't have to eat physical food, they won't have to live in houses, the physical children will. So we read that there's going to be cities, there's going to be gardens, there's going to be trees, there's going to be peace, tranquility, verdant green fields, there's going to be roads for people to travel on, there won't be any smog, there won't be any dust, dirt, killings, murders, robberies, rapes. There won't be any of that in the world tomorrow. Notice Zechariah the 8th chapter. In Zechariah 8, notice verse 3. Well, let's go to verse 4. It says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, There shall yet old men and old women dwell in the streets of Jerusalem. No more is an old man going to have to go down, and I doubt if there'll be Social Security in the world tomorrow, but many people going down now to collect the Social Security checks, and these young hoods and these thugs are down there taking it right out of their hands once they get it. So that won't happen in the world tomorrow. There will be peace. An old man and an old woman can walk down the streets, and they will feel completely and totally at peace. And every man with his staff in his hand for every age. And the streets of the city shall be full of boys and girls playing in the streets thereof. That could possibly be our children or our children's children or our grandchildren somewhere down the line. You see, the world is now filled with troubles. 
and our children are in that world. But soon, the troubled world is going to give way to a very peaceful world, a world void of crime, hatred, bigotry, bullying at school, malnutrition, disease, accidents, kidnappers, drug addiction, alcoholism, unsolicited sex, or perverts. That will not be extant in the world yet to come. And that world is called the wonderful world tomorrow. So what about the children? Oh yes, they will be in the kingdom and possibly thousands of them will be yours because we're going to see our children and our children's children and they will continue to live and dwell for 1,000 wonderful years. What we need to be doing right now, parents, is to teach our children about the Word of God and we need to be preparing them for the events that lie just ahead. Teach your children God's Word and when they are old, they will not depart from it.